Here I am with uh, Mr. Eric Haynes. Eric, I have to tell you, after looking at your website, you are probably one of the most versatile entertainers I think I've ever met, my friend. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, what is your job title? What do you go by? So when the kids, when they say, what does your dad do for a living, what are they supposed to say? Well, usually for my kids, it's plausible <laughs> deniability. They just, uh, yeah, my dad does stuff. Um, for, for the most part, I, I divide it into four categories. I'm a comedian, uh, comedy juggler, um, stilt walker, and one-man band. And those are all kind of mixed together, that there's a kind of an evolutionary story that happens with that. But uh, that's basically it. Four and, different how, and, and how did this come to be, covering so many different things? Like, obviously, you're a very talented guy. How did you put them all together? Well, I started out as a juggler because somebody paid me 10 bucks to do a kid's birthday party. And once you realize you can make money as a business, then you, you go, well, I don't have to shovel walks or mow lawns in order to make you know, money that I needed as a kid. So that immediately meant that I needed to, to uh, try different things and put together a little show. And like most performers, it was the beginning of you know, doing stuff for your church basement or whatever or for kids' birthday parties or anything else. And it snowballed. I kept on adding things so that I could have things to market for business meetings for the town I was in. I'm from Missoula, Montana, 100,000 people. So um, there wasn't anybody standing over me saying, here, I've got a job for you. You know, I'm your agent, and I'll find things for you. It was a matter of people seeing that there was something available, and then when they knew there was something that they could buy, then they would come to me, and I would put together an act for them. So if I was a fair or a school and I wanted to hire you, would we get all the above, or do you do one of the above? How do, how do you normally put this together? Like, how do you market yourself? Well, uh, it, it all depends on what you're doing. Like, um, for, for all performers, I think this is true. When you walk into a situation, you go, well, which bits am I going to do that would be most effective in this situation? So you may be able to play an adult comedy club, but then when you're going in and somebody has hired you to be a family entertainer on a family stage and there's five preschools that have brought all their little kids and sat them in the front row, you're not doing your comedy club set. So it's not necessarily a matter of uh, having something that's limited to one thing, it's a matter of doing what's appropriate for the situation. So I do a comedy club set. It has a lot of variety in it. Um, I do a, a set for little kids. It's going to have a lot of the same acts that are appropriate for kids, though, that leave out uh, anything that would be uh, considered offensive by either the fair or the festival or, or whatever like that. Um, I work as a clean comedian when I'm in uh, comedy clubs. My act is considered very clean, but it's not as clean as you need to be in order to work a fair. Fairs have very strict standards as far as what constitutes something that's appropriate or not. So you just have to size it up and, and do what's appropriate to the venue. For me doing the different things that I do, every time that I add something new, like One Man Band is something that I started doing in 2010, that means that that immediately got added in as a bit to see if it would work as part of the comedy show because I want to add something that somebody's never seen before in that context. So it, that means that all of the things are mixed together on, on some level, but then it's just a matter of what does the client want? If they just want one-man band for their fair, then I can just be the one-man band. Uh, if they just want stilts, I do some fairs where all I do is different stilt characters, four different stilt characters a day. I have other things where they just want me to do a stage show and they're not having me do roving at all. So they're all divided into different categories. There's different markets that you can go to. Um, you can do fairs, you can do school family programs. Each different market has uh, different um, requirements for what's going to work for that market. So that's the way that works. And, and, and with Erica, would you say that your work is divided up pretty evenly between the stamina comedy, the one man band, the juggling? Do you do are they all, or is one no. kind of a specialty? No, here's this is kind of an interesting, uh, I guess, philosophy thing when you look at the industry that we're in for entertainment. Uh, think of it as the African savanna, all right? So you've got your wet season, everything's profitable, all these things are coming in. There's a lot of entertainment, a lot of buyers coming out there. They want to have entertainment for their corporate event. Then you have a dry spell that comes along. For us, that was the economy crashing in, what was it, 2006, 2008. Um, from there, I went from having like $10,000 every December in bookings for corporate events down to like two two corporate events instead of ten, you know. Um, so that, that market fell out. Um, during that same year, I had been being hired to be a comedy juggler for all the fair things that I did up to that point, and just doing stilts as a sideline. And then when everything went south, well, then everybody wanted something that was more inclusive for the entire fairgrounds. 
And so all of the stilt walking became very important to them. They would rather not have it be an isolated thing where I'm entertaining 200 people at a time. They wanted it to have be the entire fairgrounds because they just wanted more bang for their buck for the money. So the roving acts became very, very important at that time. And I found myself, uh, I generated more still character costumes in order to accommodate that because I wanted them to have as big a selection as they could. So when you're looking at the, the analogy of an African savanna, those that are able to be mobile and adapt and move around really quickly are the survivors. And you'll see that like in, in the comedy thing, I, I worked as a, a comedian for eight years where that's all I did was comedy clubs, touring on the road. We would do uh, corporate events as well, but the comedy club thing dried up. All of a sudden, there were all the bookings. There were agents who had had, you know, uh, eight weeks of work, eight different weeks that were solid runs that dried up to now it's one night in the middle of Nevada, and the pay is pretty much the same as it was 15 years ago. So it's not a really viable market for me to go and say, well, I want to do a lot of comedy clubs if the money's not there. So wherever the cycle takes me, that's where I follow. I generate something so that I can survive whatever the, the thing is. I don't think that you're smart if you have a static act. It has to adapt to whatever the conditions are, and you have to keep moving and find a way to make it current. I hear you. And and you do many schools. I know on your website you have a ton of fairs, like hundreds and hundreds of fairs, but I see a lot of uh, school bookings as well. So when you go to the schools, what do you do into the schools? Well, I did um, way back when, when I was – when this whole snowball was starting and I was doing comedy juggling shows, one of the things that I did is uh, I talked to young audiences in western Montana, and they gave me a big break because they said, we're going to do this development workshop. We'd already been doing uh, juggling shows, so I, I had something to go on. Um, but they had a development thing where they sat everybody down and said, listen, you're going into schools. It has to have an educational component. It has to have this and that. And I put together a deal and went on. It was basically, at that time, I think it was about a solid month. It was broken up a little bit, but it was a solid month of school bookings where you do two or three a day. And I went around and did all these things and did it as a circus skills type of thing and related it to all the other kinds of performing that there were from classical musicians to whatever else. Um, and that was kind of uh, a great leap forward because once I had those those paid bookings coming in, then I was really hammering away, especially when I was working a lot, to get it so that I had something that they really wanted to buy. And it was in a format that is very familiar to all of us. You had to have a 45-minute set. And that is standard for fairs, that stands for school assembly programs. Um, there may be some that, that you know are a little bit each way. Some fairs only want you to do a half-hour set. But generally speaking, if you've got a 45-minute variety act set, then that's pretty standard. And that format was there. Um, since then, I don't do quite as many school assembly programs as I used to. Um, now it's mostly doing corporate events. I do comedy club bits, especially for uh, fundraisers, where it uh, can be a different crowd every time that comes in. Um, and, uh, and fairs, festivals that kind of thing. I'll, I'll get booked to do things for just one man band or I'll get booked to do things just for stilt walking, same way. So think of it this way, um, when they're calling me, they're calling like four different performers and it's just a matter of which performer they want to have show up at the, at the gig. And that means that my portfolio is diversified to put it in in terms of, of uh, investing. And if you have a diversified portfolio, when one of your stocks goes down, another one can go up and you fill the gap and you're a working entertainer. And, and do you find that when someone calls you, say, for stilt walker, and you say, oh, by the way, I also do this, this, and this, it, it helps you to get a higher fee? Does it help you to get more bookings? Like, how does it help you that way? Well, it's, it, if somebody calls me, if they look me up on the web at all, like let's say somebody calls me through an agency, and they say, well, you know, uh, we've always booked you in the past as a, as a stilt walker. I had this happen this year, as a matter of fact. Uh, anytime anything is through an agency, I always refer it back to that agency. Um, because they got me the work, it goes back to them, without a doubt. But uh, if and, and Let, let me say, that's, that's a very smart move, my friend, because a lot of entertainers wouldn't do that, and I think by doing that, you protect your agents so that they'll fire you off work on a, on a regular basis, because if I was your agent and I'm making money on you on a regular basis, I'm more inclined to find you more bookings than, than not, right? You know. Right, exactly, and it's the only ethical way to do business, I, I think. Agree. But, uh, but anyway, so... So, so they called me and said, hey, we're having you come in for this. And they had me set up to do this thing for, I think it was Boys and Girls Clubs of Seattle. And so I 
shot her an email back. I'd worked with her for years now. This is somebody that I'd probably done, I don't know, a couple shows a year for five years, where it was always a deal where they would have me come in and they would have me do stilts. And uh, one time they had me do one-man band as a roving act. Um, so I shot her back and I said, listen, um, I'm not sure what this says on the contract. I know that you want me to do this amount of time. Did you want that to be a stage show or did you want it to be stilt walking? Because I'd be willing to do the stage show for what you've got me priced for roving because I think it would be very effective. She said, I didn't know you did a stage show. This is somebody that I've known for like 10 years. Wow. And they didn't realize that it had a stage show because it had always been booked through an agent and, and the agent had just, whenever they called and, and they wanted the same thing that they'd had before, he got okay. And that's not necessarily a, a falling down on the agent's part, a little bit maybe, but uh, mostly just uh, people get used to what they're used to and they don't understand that there's other stuff out there. But yeah, it's an upsell. Every time anybody calls me um, to say that they want me for, let's say, stilt walking for their event, then it's a matter of, well, what's your theme? I have other things that I can do that may be very effective for you. And my job as an entertainer is just to give them the most effective entertaining that I can for the budget that they have. That also means from the entertainer's standpoint, um, this is kind of a, an important point, that if somebody calls me and they say they only have a budget for this much, I don't say that I will do the same show for that. I say, well, you know what? I, here's what I can do. I can massage the numbers so that it comes in for you. So you wanted three 45-minute sets for this price. I can do it at, at the price that you're quoting me. I could do it as three half-hour sets. You still get some coverage, but I'm sorry, I can't do that. I have to limit what I'm, what I'm giving you um, to fit within your budget. That way they at least know that there are some standards that I'm following. And I've got a long price sheet that I have as uh, ballparks for all the different combinations because there's probably 100 different combinations that have come through that are fairly standard for me. Um, that can be something from a festival package where they get a stage show and two roving sets for a little bit less than it would be if they booked each thing individually. Um, and the price sheet only goes out to agencies that are booking me. I don't put it on my website. I don't really share it with other entertainers, although we a lot of times entertainers will get together and talk ballpark. What's ballpark that you're doing? And, uh, the key is never to undersell. You don't want to be cutting the industry. You know, you don't want to be, you don't have everybody else going, well, I'll do the comedy show for a corporate Christmas party for a thousand dollars and then I have one guy who's going, Well, I'll do it for two hundred. I agree. Because that's just cutting your own throat. The prices should be pretty pretty good between all the different people involved. Well I think the thing is too if the price is too low, then people think that it, obviously for 200 bucks, how good could it possibly be for yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I think many times if you have a higher price, it's easier to get the booking, believe it or not, than it is to give it away, right? Yeah, I've got a good example of that, okay? So this is back when I was doing, uh, when I was first starting out and I was doing singing telegrams, I was doing uh, like clown stuff and clown makeup where I'd come and I'd do a little half hour show, a little juggling show for the thing and then I would tie balloon animals and stuff like that. And I got sick of doing it because I was doing it a lot. And I was charging, I believe it was through a balloon company, I was getting $50 to go out and do a little kid's birthday party and I was doing you know, three or four of those a day. So I got sick of doing it and I said, well, you know what, I don't want to do them anymore. So I've upped my price to $150. And the people who had been trying to talk me down from the $50 price tag, nobody balked at $150. They booked me immediately and didn't argue. And then a little bit later on, this is probably six months after that, I was going, I really, really don't like what grease paint does to my skin. So I'm not doing grease paint at all. And I'm sick of doing this. So I just want to do the poor things that are coming in where it's, you know, the medical tech convention is in town and, and they want me to be there for entertainment. So I said, well, um, I'm going to price myself out so nobody will book me again for birthday parties because I'm not interested. So I said $300. And it was the same thing. It was, uh, I do a little show, I do a little balloon animal, or I do a stilt thing. You know, just a little thing to walk in, say la di da di da to the little kid and then leave. And people bought it. It wasn't, there was no hesitation. So that was a matter of you didn't realize what the market would bear until you upped the price to a point where they were, they were just buying it. And if I was priced too low, then they would try to talk me down. Sort of like somebody, if you're at a garage sale where you've got something priced at 50 cents, and they say, well, you take 10 cents for it. But they're not looking at the thing that you've got priced at $50. They won't try to talk you down on that. They'll talk you down on something that's 25 cents instead. So perceived value is huge. You've got to charge what the market will bear. And does most of your bookings come from agents or they hire you into the gigs or do you solicit most of the gigs on your own? 
It's a combination of the two. Um, I've got certain agents that book certain things for me. Right now I have a fair agent who goes around and she, she books my fares for me. There are, there are fares that I booked before through a different agent. That other agent keeps those fares. There are fares that I've worked before that I booked myself, and they're not part of that equation. You know, I talked to this agent before I signed with them and said, listen, anything that I booked before that's booked by another agent goes back through them. Um, if you get me further work, uh, then there's a moratorium. It's after if they don't book me for two years, then it's wide open again, right? So if they book me the next year, if they rebook something that she put together for me, then immediately that goes back to her. And I've done that before with other agents as well and sometimes even cheated it in the agent's favor, saying, you know what, three years ago you booked me for this and now you're calling me for it again. It was booked through this agent before. It needs to go back through that agent. And uh, that that works. Once you understand that the, the agents are working for you, not against you, um, they deserve a commission for doing what they do and they're going to have stuff come across their desk that will not come across yours. So that works out in the end. There's only a few agents I won't work for. They're, they're just, they kind of rip you off and their reputation goes around in the performing circles and you go, well, just never work for this. You know, you're going you're gonna to get in there and find out they're going to underpay you on your paycheck. This happened to me one time, okay? I get this paycheck. It is $200 short from what we agreed on. So I said, um, this is $200 short. And they said, well, we sent it in with the deposit. Oh, really? What was the deposit? The deposit was $1,600. Um, so the agent was getting more than I was in order to do the gig. And, and that was it. It never said a word to me about anything like that. So um, there's a few out there that are really trying to scalp it. Most, if they take 15%, especially if they have it right on their contract, exactly what the percentage is, then those are the guys you work for because you can trust them. And would you say that 50% of your work comes from agents or higher? I w I'd have to look through it. Uh, that's probably pretty fair. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, and, and uh, like I say, I, I do a lot of referring back. If somebody calls me, even if it's past the expiration date, then I'll refer it back to an agent. And that just keeps them in the loop. If, if I'm making money for someone else, they're apt to be on my side. And are your prices the same if you booked, like, and I know yeah. they're probably comparable, but is an agent able to get you more money than you are on your own or both the same? Generally it? speaking, I try to keep the prices about the same so the, the percentage for the agent comes out of what I would normally charge. Somebody's not going to get a better deal if they come to me through my website. Um, they, and there's, I've even got a clause on there on the website that says if you book through an agent, tell me. It's, it doesn't change anything. It just means that I'm willing to pay the agent the percentage. And I always tell the agents if they've got somebody they're talking to, to contact me this person so they call out of the blue by somebody saying hey we got this corporate event in downtown Seattle we want to have you come in and if I don't know it's through the agent then I can book it on my own that's not a big deal to me but if I know that the agent has already contacted them sold me and then they try to end around them then I'll always put it back to the agent so it's in their it's in their best interest to contact me and say hey listen I've got you up for this thing and then I'll, I'll always go with them does that happen very often where a client will try to um, circumvent the agent and go through you after already talking to an agent? Does that happen very often? Not so much anymore. I mean, probably about 10 years ago, I had a lot of that going on, especially in the comedy scene where somebody would book me. And the, the thing in, the, in comedy was a little bit shady that way where uh, somebody would see me in a club and they'd want to book me for something, but they'd want to do it directly. They wouldn't want to go through the agent to book the club. And I always put it back to the agent to book the club. So... That's uh, for the fairs and festivals, generally speaking, if they know that I'm through an agent, then they'll always go back to the agents. It's pretty on the up and up. Do you do any mail-outs or, uh, like, how do you, um, nothing like that at all? You don't no, I'm bad at that. Um, for marketing, if you, if you looked at it from a medieval standpoint, if you are a cobbler, you would put out your shingle. And it would be hanging out there outside your door to, to let people know that, that that's what you do for a living, right? So here on the Internet, we've got social media, which uh, allows you to interact with people, to sort of you know, shake their hand, and your website, which is your real shingle, which if they really want to find out what you do, then they go there. But generally speaking, people are pretty lazy, so if, you, uh, if they're friends with you on Facebook or something, then you can just put them into your feed and generally you know, slowly feed them what you do, little videos, clips, uh, your opinions and everything, um, I'll go into that, and that's part of your marketing. So that's it. You've got your shingle hanging out. That's your marketing. For some of the stuff that's handed out, like I've got some friends who are very, very good at that. They send out regular emails, and I've been told by many people, email is the key 
sending people an email is the key. With all the social media and everything, those things shift drastically. You can go to MySpace and see a giant abandoned trailer park there. Um, but you know, as soon as people jump ship from Facebook, there's going to be a hundred other different social media sites that will that will pop up. But your email address will not be changing. People keep those pretty solid, so you want to have a, a deal. I do send out a booking notification for email, but I'm not as thorough about it as I should be. I should be sending it out on a regular basis. Um, I've got a friend who's a juggler who sends out uh, postcards. And I, tell, I can tell you that it works because he sends about two a year, and they kick around my house before someone finally throws them away. So it's sitting next to the TV, it's sitting on my desk, then it gets moved over into this pile of papers. Every single time I move a piece of paper, this is not something where, where you're thinking, oh, well, I send it out and people pick it up and they read it. They are reminded of your name several times, even if they're just cleaning up their house. So it ends up being sort of a passive marketing thing where your name is in their head. That works really well. I have not done that, though. I've relied on word of mouth. That's the most important thing. Um, some basic social media stuff, and my website. And my website's just put together by me, so it's not uh, all spectacular either, but it has enough information about me that someone can really get a good idea of what I do. See, uh, I, I thought the most impressive thing of your, that's the one thing that I was very impressed with about your website is you listed all your clients. Like yeah. on the back page, here's 500 clients, here they are. You know, anyone could pick up the phone and contact any one of them, and the fact that you put them all there, like hundreds and hundreds of fairs and hundreds of schools and all the uh, boys and girls clubs and you know you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients listed there that is very impressive and most people in my opinion when I saw that I figure I, I, I don't need to look anywhere else look at the show the guy's doing but that is very well done the fact that you listed them all out there well thank you thanks um, can, I, can I share something with you that sure. we did when we first when I first started doing comedy that was smart um, we needed something, when, you, when I talk about word of mouth, word of mouth doesn't need to be direct. Uh, so if somebody says something nice to you after a show, what I did is I pull out a little journal about this big. And I would say, would you sign the comment book? And I flip it open. And let's say in a comedy club, three quarters of those are wasted because they're drunk people scrawling nasty yeah. things in your comment book. But every once in a while, you get the manager of the club. You get somebody who's seen a lot of comedy who would write something insightful in there. And we took those comments and put it in the promo so that it was a, a word of mouth thing where this person said this about us. And especially, like I say, if it was a club owner or somebody who was in charge of the entertainment, then that would be a lot more credible than just some drunk audience member who's saying something. But the audience members oftentimes would have very insightful comments about the show too. So that comment book, um, I've got three of them that we filled out. I, like I say, I don't do this much anymore because I've got other, other things that I'm doing with it. But uh, it's a good idea, especially if you're starting out. You have to have some credibility where people are willing to say that they liked what you did. Well, that's a great idea. And you just carry that book with you on your shows? Yeah, and after the show was done, then if somebody came up and said, nice job, I'd say, oh, thanks. Would you be willing to write that in my comment book? Or they would say something that was even better. You know, you're the best show I've ever seen. That's great. That's fantastic. Would you be willing to write that in the comment book? Um, I've got some other friends. I've got a magician friend who's really good at this. He, uh, if somebody comes to talk to him, um, he flips open his camera and, and does a little interview thing and immediately posts it to social media, whatever the positive comment that somebody's saying about him. All that's very good because it allows everybody else to see that somebody actually saw the show. Social proof, will, social proof, right? Say, proof, yep. Good idea. What advice would you have for an entertainer? Let's say I'm, I'm just starting out and I'm, I'm a comedian or a juggler or ventriloquist and I want to go and approach an agent. Is there anything that you would recommend in how to find an agent even? Um, that's a little bit tricky. I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to go with a little more basic than that on you. Okay, uh, a lot of people think that entertaining is somehow very much different than a regular job. But in entertaining, it is especially important that you show up on time, you're easy to work with, and you do a good job. So if you've got those three things, that's important. You show up on time, you're easy to work with, and that goes with everything. Like if you pull onto a fairgrounds and you have all kinds of demands for the, the people, <laughs> then that's going to reflect yeah, badly. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So how easy are you to work with? Are you pleasant to be around? Is it, are you somebody that they'd like to hang out with? That's what the fair book income conferences are for, right? Is that, it's for them not necessarily to evaluate your act, although that's a big part of it. It's would they like to be around you for several hours a day, because that's what they're going to have to do, and uh, do good work. The good work part of it is up to the act. If you want to be a good comedian, make people laugh and make people laugh in a bunch of different uh, situations. 
if you are, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, be good at it. Um, as far as finding an agent is concerned, before you go to the agent, you're going to have to do a little legwork yourself. You go out and you find some jobs. You do a, you set up a, you talk to somebody in a coffee house, and you say, hey, I'd like to do a show, and you, you don't charge very much for it because you're just learning. But you keep on going and selling yourself and doing little things to make sure that you have something that is a viable product before you go and talk to an agent. If you're underdeveloped, you just learned to juggle two weeks ago, you've been a open mic stand-up comedian in front of nobody but your friends for two years now, you are not ready to go and hit the big time. What you need to do is go and find other opportunities to perform. When you have a solid half hour, which means you've got a full hour of material, but you've got a solid half hour that you can do anywhere and you know it's going to be successful, that's when you're really going to be looking at, at uh, talking to some people. Um, if uh, you got to figure these agents, they have to sit through these awful, awful videotapes, or you know, somebody sends a link of them sort of sloppily doing something and no audience response. That's not the way to do it. You have to have a viable product before you start going to to have other people resell it for you. I, I think the other thing is too is that if I was an agent and I had an entertainer approach me and their fee was two hundred dollars a day. It wouldn't be worth even promoting them because your twenty percent wouldn't be worth, you know, for forty dollars. Why would you take the time yeah. even to book this person? But if they could command a fee of a thousand or a couple thousand, five thousand, or something at least a decent meat and potatoes, it'd be well right. worth picking up a phone, booking you, and making five hundred dollars or at least three or four hundred dollars for your effort, right? Right. Yeah. No. Um, uh, for and, and from a from an agent standpoint. If somebody calls and says that they have a $200 budget for their event, then their first reaction should be, I'm sorry, I don't have anybody. All the people I have are far more advanced than that. I'm not going to be able to find anybody. You may be able to find somebody to work for that, maybe at the high school or something like that. There's a, there's a, a big disconnect between uh, somebody who's looking for entertainment who doesn't realize that it costs any money and an agent who in theory has the top entertainers in the industry at their fingertips. They're not going to be looking at the little tiny things. Do you go to any of the fair conventions? Any, any, I any? do. Just got back from the Washington Fair Convention. So here's what you need to know about convention for all the acts that are out there. If you're going into a larger market and the fair industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, um, you're looking at block bookings that are going to be, you know, four days, five days, 13 days, 17 days. It all depends on how long the fair runs. They're huge. It's very competitive to get in there. Um, like I said, the, the big thing about the fair conventions is they are looking to see if they can get along with you. So it's a social networking thing. It doesn't necessarily happen the first time you go to a convention. They're going to be looking at you skeptically the first time that they meet you because then they need to hear from other people, other people who actually do book you in the long run. How were they? Were they easy to work with? Were they on time? Did they do a good job? So if that happens and you go and you get booked a little bit, then that spreads pretty quickly as far to because they all talk to each other. Um, for convention, if you're doing it for the first time and you're, you're positive that you've got a good act, like let's say you've been uh, doing magic for 15 years, you've got a lot of credits and you want to actually do a full showcase, Showcase is where you do your 20 minutes of your act in front of everybody for the lunch or for the dinner, um, and and that's very set up. You're you're on a full stage. You've got sound, lights, everything is in your favor. Um, they're all sitting there captive, so that's a great thing to do, especially if they don't know you. At least they get a chance to see your act and see that you're really solid. Um, if you are uh, if you want to go a little bit less, then you can also apply for the MC spot. The MC spot usually if they charge for showcases. Um, you, they don't charge as much or they don't charge at all for you to MC the thing. That gives you an opportunity to show yourself being yourself, being in charge. Um, they may or may not want you to do material. I did material. I just did, and nobody else applied. Here's the drying market thing. Um, we had two people who had checked off on their thing that they were willing to MC for these showcases. If you're MCing, you're up every time. So let's say there's three acts. You're introducing three different acts to get three different opportunities to see you. And if there's a delay getting the band set up, then you're expected to do to entertain the people while, while they're waiting to set up. So you have an opportunity to basically do a showcase for free. And I did both. I mean, I did IMC um, an afternoon and an evening session. And then the next day I did a full showcase. So I had the opportunity to be seen by a whole lot of people. 
Um, but those are all good things to do. Um, a lot of people that are newbies, I'll kind of take them aside and say, listen, here's what you need to know. Relax, be friendly with everybody, um, just make sure that you, you talk to as many people as possible. A lot of the social networking things that go on with the hospitality suites where it's basically like you're walking into a bar and talking to people, that's where you, that's where people get to know you. And if they get to know you and they like you, they'll book you. Um, assuming that you already have the, the component that we're not talking about, which is your act. Your act is very important. But uh, well, I, I how do you work? I was going to comment on when you were saying about making sure you have a top-notch half-hour show. I think that's extremely important if you're showcasing, because nothing worse getting up there. You're not ready, and you would have been better off not to do anything, because you might have got some bookings. But now that you show how terrible your act is, you're not going to yeah. get any now, right? So, you know, if you're going to showcase, you want to make sure that you have something uh, definitely above uh, average for sure. I would say. Yeah, yeah, or uh, and also show that you are experienced enough to, to have any situation. I've got a friend who's Louis Fox. He's a magician. You're a magician. You probably know him. So uh, he gets on stage for one of the showcases. He starts talking, and the sound company that year was a little less, less than good, right? So his sound is awful. So his headset, there's something going on with it. So without s stopping talking, he grabs the... the wireless microphone that the MC and everybody else uses, starts talking to that very calmly, pulls out his little thing that clips to his shirt, goes on with the show as if nothing has happened. It was such a smooth transition that in my mind, if I was watching him as a, as a buyer, I would be looking at it and going, um, well, was is that good? Was it bad? There's so many different ways that could have been handled. But the way he did it was as if nothing had happened at all. It's as if he had planned it, and it was so smooth that you went, this guy really, really knows what he's doing. It made that showcase a better showcase than if nothing had gone wrong. So you have to be prepared for whatever happens. You can, And the showcases are sort of high intensity because you've got all the other performers. You've got top-notch performers from all over everywhere um, sitting in the audience. Um, and so you're, it's a little bit nerve-wracking because you're doing that in front of them, too. Um, if you've been and, in the business and, and, a while, and, and, it, and I find this, having done a, quite a few fairs, when you showcase, the conditions are never perfect by no means. I mean, because you're sharing the stage with five or ten other acts, and there's equipment, and it's always, I find it's a smaller area than I would have been performing if I was doing my regular gig. And yet right. you're there saying you're not exactly sure what time you're supposed to be on. I mean, because they might say, okay, you're on at 9 o'clock, but it could be 9.20 before you're up there. And uh, right. you definitely have to be seasoned, I think, to in order to take on these showcases for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a non-ideal situation. It's almost like street performing where you've got all the distractions going on. I, there's worst-case scenarios. Uh, there's one Ohio has a freak show where the guy's over announcing and now come in and see the da 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 And there's a helicopter pad right behind the stage. So the helicopter lands and takes off during the act's show. Wow. So you have to be prepared for that. There's going to be a lot going on. And we try to work with the fairs as much as we can to, to tell them how to set up the stage so that you're close enough for or how to set up the time of day that you do if you've got an audience participation show, you don't have it right when the gates open when nobody's there. You know, they, they got to come in, see what's going on, and then go over. Um, but, yeah, you're in a non-ideal situation just by virtue of the fact that it's outside, it's hot, there's no shade, there is shade. There's shade, but it's over there 500 yards from the stage. Um, all kinds of different things that will be going on. So it's a different uh, venue than... Like, I have a lot of friends who are cruise ship entertainers, and they come in from this very insulated, everything is set up perfectly. They're in a beautiful theater with full sound and a captive audience. And then they come out and they go, you know what? I was thinking that fairs were going to be sort of second to, to doing this, that I, I could do my B-list material. I says, no, I am doing my A-list material just to get by at the fair situation. So it's, uh, it's a little bit harder deal when you've got all that distraction going on. What, uh, what, and again, any words of wisdom you would get for someone going into the fairs uh, for the first time? Or like if I was never done a fair before, but I've, uh, I'm a juggler, comedian, anything you would recommend that, that maybe somebody wouldn't think of? Like one thing that you could say, wow, make sure you got this right, you know? Um, the, well, one of the first things I would do is do a little research. If you've never been to a fair but you want to go into the fair industry, go to a fair, especially go to one of the bigger fairs in your state and go to the stages and watch all the shows. Watch the bands, watch the, uh, watch the variety acts, if you're a variety act. Go and talk to the sound guy when he's not doing his job. I mean, when, he, when he's not involved in that, because he has to be focused on that. But if, you're, if he's got a break in between where he's, he's walking around for a second, um, just say, you know, 
you can talk to him as long as you're not distracting him from his job. Um, go and talk to the entertainers who are actually on stage. Entertainers love to be talked to after they're done on stage as long as they don't have another show that they have to set up for or they're, they have to get everything out of the way for the next act to get up there. So you can't talk to them then. You have to wait until they've got their stuff off stage. But most of us are pretty good about if, you, if a fan comes up and talks to us, we'll talk to them. We'll tell them more information than they ever needed to know. Um, but if you go and see the acts and see how it's set up, and then think about how your act would be set up on that stage. If you're an illusionist and you've got 5,000 pounds of equipment that you have to put on and off stage, <laughs> and you go to the fair and you realize that they have a 15-minute window between you and the act that just gets off. And the act that just got off is a salsa band. And now your illusionist stuff has to fit on stage with the salsa band that have 5,000 pounds of equipment as well. So that shift, you have to figure out how you're going to do it. Maybe simplify the act. Sometimes you can get away with it. I've always been very prop heavy, but uh, sometimes there's ways to do it, to make things collapsible or to make things so that they set up very quickly so that you can get in and out. That's, that's a big thing. If I was looking at bands, I was, I was giving bands advice at the, at the fair. I said, you've got three things going on. You were a good musician. You sold it on stage. They didn't just stand there and play, but they actually did stuff to perform as an entertainer. And the other thing that I was looking for is if were they able to get on and off stage very quickly and work well with the sound guy to just dial it in really lickety-split. Because there is no delay at a fair. Some of them, uh, if you're in the wrong situation where their entertainment director is just a novice or, or doesn't actually know a lot about how the, the acts actually work, they may do something like schedule a stage with no breaks in between the entertainers. So and if you have a band... That, and I think it's very important for entertainers to let the director know that, look, I need 18 minutes in between or 14 minutes or 12 minutes. This is what time yeah. I need for the change order because same thing, you know, they would book one from 9.30 to 10 and one from 10 to 10.30, one from 10.30 to 11. That ain't going to happen because yes. there's no time to switch over at all in there where you need something, right? Right. Yeah, and just to do a sound check, just to make sure most of us as entertainers all bring our own headset mic. Because um, if somebody hands you something that you don't know who works or, you know, they hand you a nice expensive crown microphone and you're a juggler and you're going to whack it during the thing, uh, you just have to bring your own equipment so that you know that it's all set up. So every, the really experienced people, the experienced sound companies and fairs will know that it takes a few minutes to make sure everything is set. But you should be looking uh, time-wise at a minimum of 15 minutes. You should be able to set up your show in 15 minutes. If you have a half hour, that's more ideal. That's usually what you try to negotiate with the fair, saying, listen, I need at least a half hour set up, half hour takedown. But that can, that can boil into 15 minutes really quick, and that may mean that you are loading your stuff off the stage while the next act is loading their stuff on. You have to be able to cooperate with people and make sure that the shift happens really quick because you're just a delivery system for the entertainment. So you want to make sure that the next act looks as good as you did, and you want to make sure that that changeover is as smooth, as quick as it can be to make it as easy for the entertainment director. If they're frustrated, that means it gets back to the fair board, and they're probably not going to watch you anymore if, you, if it's a big pain to have you set up. Now, Eric, here in Canada, when I, when like I've done a lot of fairs here as well, um, the fairs here offer two different stages. One is what they call the free stage. This right. is where uh, smaller acts would perform throughout the day. They have maybe five or eight acts. You know, they're on continuously throughout the day. Maybe each act would uh, perform 30, 45 minutes, but they might be up two or three times a day. And people would gather around. They would see that act for free. Um, I've also been in what they call the grandstand shows, where you're performing for two or 3,000 people. Back at that time, I was using Lions, Tigers, Cougars, and Jaguars, you know, the big cats. Yeah. <laughs> so you could do a show for a couple thousand people, but, you know, the um, you could still make good money at both, but if you did the grandstand, you did one big show for 90 minutes for thousands of people, or you did the free stage where you did three or four half-hour shows throughout the day. Do you do both of those, or are, are those offered in the U.S.? Or do they have the grandstands and the free shows, or...? Well, the, uh, it's divided up a little bit differently. There is no set deal. Any fair can have anything running, okay? If they're a smaller fair, they're going to be looking at stretching their budget, so they're going to want community acts to come in. So that could be a community dance group that's going to be there that day for free. Um, it could mean a, a band, a rock band. Yeah. Um, like, uh, and, and, and when I say free, the entertainer still gets paid, but the uh, audience is not charged over and above. Like They come in as part of their fair admission. But then they right. usually have what they call the grandstand shows, where it's in the in the big theater, not a theater, but it's a, 
you know, they might see three or four thousand people there at one time in a big stadium, and you're on the track, maybe a horse racing track or whatever. Exactly. You go to Mama stage, and you're there to entertain for two hours, right? Right. Um, the grandstand acts are usually going to be in the national touring acts, so that's where you've got bands, uh, you've got uh, comedy for us. This uh, one of the deals, Bill Cosby or the Newsboys or uh, you know something that's a national act that's going to be coming in. It can be uh, rock bands that have been around for a long time. Sticks will come in a lot of times. The fairs. We're no Yankovic. Um, uh, those those are the grandstand acts. Um, what you're talking about for the U.S. would be more grounds acts. Grounds acts are everything that when people walk in, they can go over and see the show for free. Um, when I'm talking about uh, this thing where they've got people from the community coming in, a lot of times they'll have a, what they call a community stage, and or they'll have their uh, main one of the stages that's on the fairgrounds. You could have uh, three, four stages on a fairgrounds that are all different free acts that are paid entertainers that are going to be on those stages. But they may intersperse some things in there for uh, community people who just just want to be there, show off what they do. So that could be a dance group, which, by the way, is a nightmare if you're a variety entertainer because that means they've taken up, they've got 50 kids in the dressing rooms back there, and they're going to be running right up against the time, and you are going to have to haul your stuff through um, and with all these kids in the way. But uh, but it's a great way to get the community in there, and you end up with a huge crowd if you can get them to stay for your show. But, uh, but yeah, those are all... Uh, just grounds acts. So if you go onto one of the fair websites for the United States, you'll see them usually listed as grounds acts. Um, and then they have roving acts. Um, and that's just anybody who's doing, you know, I do a lot of roving. I think it's a great way to do it. Where I do roving one man band or still characters, or I do one called Rocket Man that's a unicycle deal with and, a rocket. And, and would you get paid for walk around as much as you yes. would as being yeah. on that uh, free stage? Yeah, um, here's or a the good ball stage or whatever you call it there. Uh, yeah, uh, for me uh, and for most of the variety acts down here in the States, it's done on the basis of you're booked for a day, and then you just negotiate what you're going to do during that day. For me, um, the standard is sort of three sets a day. Um, some acts only do two sets a day, like most uh, um, uh, hypnotists just usually do two sets a day. They do like an afternoon show and then an evening show. Um, most of the other acts usually do three sets a day, and that could be a combination of either stage acts or roving acts. Uh, for me, I think they get the most bang for their buck if they do me as a one stage act, one stilt walking set, one uh, one man band set, and another one man band set, or a different stilt character. I do four sets a day, which is a little bit unusual, but uh, that's that's it. So you're looking at a day rate for the fair, for whatever the length of the run is, um, where they have the option of checking off those boxes for what they want you to do. What advice would you give to an entertainer looking how much, like, I don't know how much to price my act. Like, how do I determine what the price should be? Like, any, how would you, and that's a tough question for many entertainers. Don't work not too sure cheap. what to charge, right? <laughs> don't work too cheap, that's all. Yeah. Um, that, you, you have to feel out what your market is. Um, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice, though, for all you acts out there who are just starting out. Move to where the food is. If you are in Orlando, Florida, where the going rate for stilt walkers is like 10 bucks an hour, don't do stilt walking there. Go somewhere where they pay money to see stilt walkers, right? Um, so there's different rates for different areas of the country for what they're willing to pay for entertainment. You just have to find out what your market is that you want to go to, um, what the going rate. That means making friends with other entertainers. They are other entertainers, there's some people who are hyper-competitive against other, other people in their field. But most of them that I've met, at least, uh, once you break the ice, are we all are on, the, on the same page. The more we work, if the acts are good that go out there, that means it generates more work for good acts. So if an act is good, I will refer them. I'll, I will say that they're good. I'll talk to people. And it doesn't make any difference to me if it's me or somebody else working a fair, as long as they have a good act in there. Because if they have good entertainment, that means they will continue to hire good entertainment people come and see good entertainment, then more people are going to want to come and see it because it was good. Um, so there's, you got to talk to other entertainers. That's a, a personal thing that you've got to ask them what they charge, what the ballpark is for a particular type of act, um, and, and what the market will bear. The market where you are may be completely different than what we do down here. Your setup in Canada is different from what we have here um, as far as, as how things work out. Um, there's a big upheaval now down here in the States because of the economy and, and a lot of different state agencies are slashing budgets for the fairs. So that was a big issue for our convention was uh, there's no state money coming in. Well, 
from what I've been told, in Canada, you don't have state money that goes into the fares. In Texas, they don't have state money that goes into the fares. So the industry is going to be different depending on where you are based on, on what the current economic conditions are and what the standard for how much you're willing to pay. If I go into California, um, they can get a local juggler who's very good because there's a huge scene down there for a lot cheaper than they can to bring me in, so they have to look for extra value elsewhere if they're going to pay my fee to bring me down into California. And that usually means that uh, they're looking at me as a one-man band rather than a juggler. So that could mean if your area that you live in is inundated with magicians, look at markets where there's not a magician yet and go move in there. Um, but you have to, you just have to ask around, find out what a reasonable rate would be. Um, a lot of times if you go through an agency that books a lot of stuff, you have different ones around the country that do everything from seeing telegrams and they offer a whole bunch of different things and they're kind of an aggregating site for entertainers. Not necessarily an agency that's going to push you, but when they get a call, they'll have a list of people that they check to see if they can do something. Um, if you talk to them about what prices they would charge for your act, then that'll give you a good ballpark. Good idea. Eric, I, um, I pretty much have the questions here. Um, anything else you'd like to mention? That any, words of, any final words of wisdom to share as we part here? Um, we're all in the same boat here. If you see an act that's good, promote them, talk about them, uh, have conversations with them, try to be original. That's the one of the big things that gets lost in a lot of this. Uh, if everybody is doing the same jokes, then there is no variety and, and the industry dies. If you're a magician and you buy a routine, out of a book, make it your own. Find a way to twist it so that it doesn't look exactly the same. I did a fair one time that had three magicians. All three of them did the same routines. One of them did it as a little kid show. One of them did it as a magician, magician, magician-y, magician, I guess. And one of them said that they were an illusionist. And they all three did at least five of their routines were exactly the same, just different colored scarves. So find a way to make it unique. Um, as long as you do that and you don't steal material from other acts, the industry will grow. If you steal material from other acts, no matter how good that line is that you heard them say, then you're doing a disservice to it and it's going to make everything dry up. Don't steal from other acts. Generate your own material. And if you can't generate it on your own, find someone who's a joke writer and talk to them and say, write some jokes for me and I'll pay you for them. That's uh, that's. This is my soapboxy part of it. Try to be original. Try to do something nobody else is doing. If you do that, then our industry grows. If it's all the same and it's homogenized, our industry dies. Find your unique selling proposition, right? Offer them what? something you find a unique selling proposition. Yeah. Offer the client something different that, that no one else is bringing to the table. And I think I think you're very smart by by com by combining some different talents. You can so again, it makes you stand out. The fact that you are a juggler and a one man band and this and this and this and that, right? Opposed to one of the above, right? Right. Yeah. Eric, uh, you know you've uh, you've answered a lot of uh, really good questions here, and uh, I know that your input is going to help a lot of other other entertainers. And I really appreciate you taking the time. To oh, my pleasure.